name is Omotayo Adiola and I am the author of How To Be Single. I call it the definitive guide to singleness, which doesn't mean that it's the definite way to keep you single. But what I believe is that it explains what it means to truly, truly be single in the best way. I wrote this book because I realized that the definition of singleness is normally negative. Most people feel like it is a bad thing to be single and singleness brings the idea of lack like you're lacking something. Um, but for me, my definition of singleness is being whole, perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Knowing that you are complete and that you are valuable in and of yourself, even as you are open to being in a relationship, because that is also an important aspect of the book. I'm going to be reading the first two chapters of my book. Chapter one, Valentine's Day. It was February 14th, 2017, and social media was really getting on my nerves. On the one hand, there were couples who proudly showed off their flowers, chocolate, surprise singers, and all other forms of evidence to show that they were loved, admired, wanted. On the other hand, there were the fierce feminists who didn't need a man, and anyway, Valentine's Day was just an over-commercialized capitalist scheme. Then there were the encouragers, you know, married people who admonished single ladies not to feel the pressure of the day. Your single season is the most important time of your life. Find your purpose. Seek God more and enjoy this time, they said, while thanking their husbands for being the best thing to have ever happened to them. But don't feel lonely today. Jesus loves you every day. The lovebirds were annoying, but the encouragers were the worst. I remember talking to one of my friends on the phone. These people end up making single people feel guilty for feeling lonely, I ranted. Going on about how we should focus on our purpose up and down the place. Well, what about those of us who have found our purpose and are already close to God? What about single people who are thriving in their single season already? Why can't we be content with our lives and still want to be married? Why does everyone act like feeling lonely is something to be ashamed of? Hmm, she replied. Does anyone tell a woman who really wants to get a good job that she's complete in herself and doesn't need a better job? Does anyone tell a woman who has been trying for a baby to keep working on her character and enjoy her married without children years? Of course not. Then why do we continue shaming single people for desiring marriage? So true, my married friend said. I feel like I have so much to say about being single, I sighed. Then you should talk about it. Yeah, I muttered. But I was afraid. If I started to talk about singleness, I would have to put myself out there. Not only that, wouldn't I have to remain single in order to be a true authority on the matter? And I didn't want to be single anymore. I was so tired of being strong, being fine, being alone. It feels like I've wanted to be married since I was born. I'm the only girl in a family of four brothers and two parents, and I grew up okay. I had food to eat, clothes on my back, and school fees were paid, but there was always an ache in my heart that I eventually filled with the imagination of marriage. I stumbled on one of my mom's Mills and Boone romance novels when I was eight, and the steamy passion of forbidden love made the ache deepen. The love stories painted the picture of the possibility of something that could cure my heartache. The characters seemed to know exactly how I felt. They would fall in love and exclaim some version of, Oh my life, I've been searching for something. I didn't know what it was, but now I found it in you. That's it, I reasoned. I just needed to find this love and it would cure my loneliness. I became hungrier for romance novels and they painted picture after picture of the many different ways I could hope for the hole in my heart to be filled. But I was also heartbroken in advance as I realized Nigerian men don't buy flowers or have witty conversations and flirtatious banter. At least, I had never seen my parents do any such thing. As far as I could see, it was all, mommy, is food ready? And tell your daddy he has a visitor between them. That made me cry even more, and I decided that I would have to find a way out of the country to find my perfect Italian heir, who was taking a break from the pressures of his fabulous life because his wealthy parents were trying to force him to marry a woman he didn't love. He would find me, an unlikely Nigerian, with strange hair and a beautiful heart, and we would fall impossibly in love. Then he would break up with me because it could never be. But weeks later, he would walk into the art gallery or bookstore where I work at and confess that it was only me that he had ever truly felt alive with, and he would risk his fortune for that true love. 
Then when I was 15, I met a guy. He was witty and intelligent and even thought it was cool to buy flowers, even though he never did buy me any. And I realized I could find Italy right here. The guy broke my heart, Sha. But that was just a small price to pay for the realization that my dream could actually come to pass in Nigeria. I would eventually meet other guys, get my feelings hurt over and over, while still waiting for the one who would make all the heartache worth it. But heartache is never worth it. I remember one guy I dated who kept me physically close but was completely distant emotionally. Whenever I would ask what the status of our relationship was, you know, the what are we doing conversation, he would sigh condescendingly and roll his eyes. We're together. I like you. You like me. We don't need it to be official, he would say. But when anyone asked him if he was seeing anyone, his answer was no. Of course, they would get back to me and I would confront him. So and so said you denied me. He would sigh again. You know I don't like people knowing my business. Everyone who is important knows about you. Listen, this is a scam. And it is still very much alive and active. The important people are the ones he can ask to watch his back while he goes around doing whatever else he wants to do. These important people are his guys and they're fully aware of his shady business. There's a bro code, something like, thou shalt pretend that every woman is important as long as thy bro requireth it. P.S. Sometimes family members are the most dangerous important people. Every babe that's with such a guy will get the same lines. Babe, let's just keep this between us. My guys really like you. My mom said I should say hi. And yet, it means nothing. All right, so the reason why I wrote that particular part of the story is that it happened to me, it's happened to all of us, I'm sure. But I find that women still continue to fall for that. The longer we remain single and we start to long for love, the more we start to look for signs that, that help us identify who the one is. And a lot of the time, those signs lead us to even more heartache because in the end, you, you can't really find your value in someone else. You have to find it in yourself first. That's what would actually help you tell the difference between someone who cares about you and someone who doesn't. Many years after I had been scammed, I inadvertently found myself acting as one of the important people in someone else's scam. This babe had been with this guy for a while, almost a year. She thought they were committed. One day, we were hanging out. My friend, this babe, my friend's brother, and I. We were sharing funny stories from past experiences, and I was talking about this top secret relationship scam. Any guy who doesn't take you to public places on dates is dodgy, I shared. If you only hang out with like his brother or best friend, but he doesn't take you out to introduce you to his colleagues, run. Then she said, I've never met his friends, just you guys. No, I'm sure you've hung out with them. I laughed, dismissing it. No, seriously, she giggled, just you guys. And that's when I realized I was an accessory to his crime. My friend, the smooth operator, laughed and pointed out the many times they had traveled together or something seemingly important like that, and we changed the topic. Later, when I accosted him with it, he boldly asserted, I haven't asked that out, so whatever. Do you plan to? I mean, it's not necessary. He was getting everything he wanted and she was happy. What was the worst that could happen? Listen, ladies, just because he has met your parents and you've met his siblings doesn't mean he's actually serious. Lawyers will tell you only a verbal or written agreement is valid. An assumption based on what we hang out all the time is a scam. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Despite how much I desired marriage, it just didn't happen. The guys I wanted to marry didn't want to marry me, and I didn't want to marry the one who wanted to marry me. Sometimes I lay in bed and wonder whether it was possible to dissolve from loneliness, like just disintegrate into a pile of dust and be blown away by the wind. I can be spectacularly dramatic when I choose to let my emotions lead my thoughts. And yet, the weird thing is that none of this showed on the outside. Of course, I moaned about being single with my friends until they all got married. But I was never that person who asked everyone to hook her up. I went out a lot, weddings, parties, etc. But I was never the one who made eye contact and flirted confidently. One of my guy friends said to me, you act like you're not single. Which I took as a compliment at first, but then I started to wonder. You know how it is when you go out and you see the lads checking out the ladies and the ladies smiling coyly back, batting their lashes suggestively without even saying a word? 
or when a babe takes a walk around the party, you know, to look for her friends, but she walks slowly by herself. Well, I walked too fast. I laughed and chatted with the people I already knew, and for the life of me, I still don't know how to bat my lashes. I acted like I was with my friends rather than out on the prowl. My single signal was a confusing amber, and I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know whether I was supposed to do anything about it. I felt confident when I was out and I loved to dance, but I always went home disappointed when I didn't get chatted up. Another full face of makeup and carefully chosen outfit wasted yet again. And then the few guys who would occasionally take my number wouldn't call. Was there something wrong with me? Even if it wasn't like wrong wrong, maybe just a little off. Maybe I was just a little weird. Maybe I wasn't sexy enough. After all, my ex had told me I had the bum of a white woman. Maybe, maybe, maybe. There's this common saying, there's a hole in everyone's heart that only God can fill. <laughs> Whenever I come across it, I think to myself, that doesn't even make any sense. God is too big to fit in a hole. And even if there really is such a thing, then the fact that there is a hole for God doesn't mean it's the only hole. Pretty certain there are many other holes in our hearts that many different things are meant to fill. I mean, I had a marriage shaped hole and a money-shaped hole I was trying to fill. And if God wanted a hole of his own, fine by me, but he could go ahead and fill it up by himself. Furthermore, this whole marriage thing, Seth, people didn't really look happy in it. Wives were always complaining about their husbands and threatening to leave because we're not in the olden days anymore and a woman doesn't need her husband to make ends meet. I don't have to take it from him. Men also stopped trying to be romantic, lost interest in their wives after they had had a few babies, and generally thought they were doing the women a favor by staying with them. Some men bragged that they were good husbands because they were discreet. No, I can never disrespect my wife by cheating in her face for everyone to see. I keep it away from home. Aunts advised, see, all men are the same. Just find one you can manage and close your eyes. A married man once told me that he loved his wife, but he just had a weakness for other women. And she understood him. Whatever works for you, I thought. But if these were my only options, they were extremely bleak. But I couldn't understand. If marriage was a bed of private misery and public pretense, why were these very same unhappy men and women trying to encourage me to enter into it? Ah, no, but marriage can be really sweet, someone would say in between complaining about her husband. It really seemed like the women were perfect and the men were the ones with the problem. What was even more ridiculous was that, even after everything I had seen, heard and learned about the darn thing, that achy hole in my heart was still dreaming of finding one who would defy all the odds in the universe and actually fill it with love. I was ashamed of this persistent desire to be married. I mean, I knew better than to tie my hopes and dreams to the conformist idea of a union between a man and a woman that statistically was 50% likely to end in tears and regret. It felt as if desiring marriage meant that I was not a strong woman, that I was breaking the feminist ranks and giving my power away to a member of the patriarchy. And yet, every Valentine's Day, I would find myself single, alone and unwanted, dreaming of the day I would also become an encourager. Oh, I used to be like you, wishing someone would complete me. Then I found out that no one can complete you for good. P.S. Thank you for the flowers, baby. You're the best and I love you. Happy Valentine's Day. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. And most importantly, share. And oh, wait, wait, wait. Also, don't forget to turn on post notification. Bye.